Um, everyone, uh, welcome to this webinar, uh, Your Access India Webinar, PhD Opportunities in Europe. My name is Samram Kumar. I am the country representative of Your Access, which is the organizer of this webinar. I'm happy to see that so many of you have attended. Uh, there is a huge interest on international career, on international collaboration. Today we have a very nice uh, and interesting panel of uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, from different European countries, and I'll take the opportunity to welcome uh, the panelists of uh, today's webinar. I start with Dr. Vivek Dham, who is the senior advisor of, uh, at the EU delegation at the Re Research and Innovation section. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Vivek. Welcome uh, again back to our webinar. Then I would like to welcome Dr. Indranil Ghosh, who is uh, also uh, the uh, Research Innovation Senior Advisor at the Embassy of Switzerland. Uh, welcome, Thank Dr. You. Indranil. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. Uh, also, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Subroto Chakraborty, who is the Educational Officer at NUFIC NESO. That's the agency promoting uh, study opportunities in the Netherlands. Good afternoon, Subroto. Thanks for joining us. And also a warm welcome. Good afternoon, Mark. Thank you. And of course, a warm welcome to Dr. Mika Thironen, who is the uh, Science and Education Officer at the Embassy of Finland uh, in New Delhi. Currently, Mika, you are in Finland. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good morning Thank to you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so uh, before we start with our webinar session, I wanted to just let you know that you have the opportunities at attended to post questions to the panelists there is a question a box you can write your questions and after each presentation we will try to answer uh, your questions uh, due to time constraint we might not be able to answer all questions so we you will have the opportunity afterwards we will share the presentations and the contact details of the speakers so you can also direct your questions to them uh, I would also ask the panelists to please, uh, once uh, the, speak, the first speaker starts, to unmute your mic so that we don't have a feedback. And um, either turn off your camera or leave it on, that's up to you. But as soon as the presentation is uh, finished, the first one, I ask everyone to come back on the screen because we might also have a more interactive Q&A depending on the questions. So um, uh, that's now, now from my side. Uh, please, uh, Vivek, you have the first uh, presentation, Dr. Vivek Dham from the EU delegation. He will talk about the Maurice Godowska Career Action PhD programs. These are full EU funded uh, PhD programs. Uh, Vivek will tell you what is in for you as an Indian uh, researcher or PhD candidate. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you, Samrat. Uh, is my screen visible? It's, it's perfectly visible. Okay, thank you. I will start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in such a huge number on behalf of a European delegation, European Commission, and all the member state associated countries. We welcome you to this um, second webinar on PhD opportunities in Europe. Uh, from my side, I'm going to give you a brief uh, uh, presentation on uh, the scholarship program offered by the European Commission under the Marie Sodaska Curie Action Program. So this is what my topic will be of a presentation. So in next uh, 20, 25 minutes, I will just quickly go, go over it, uh, what it is and how we can apply for this uh, program. So as Samrat already mentioned, each uh, session will have a Q&A and then a general Q&A. And you can also send us the, the question uh, after the, the meeting as well. So European Commission basically offers a whole sort of uh, Euro, um, career development plan uh, starts from uh, Erasmus uh, program. So that is meant for the master's, PhD, postdoc, excellence of uh, researchers under the uh, European Research Council, uh, imminent researchers, which also benefits from ERC advanced grants. So a lot of Nobel laureate is also part of this ERC grant. So, this is what the whole spectrum of offers which uh, career development offers um, by the European Commission. Uh, but today's um, topic is specifically uh, focused on Marie Sudaska Curie. So I will be only speaking about the Marie Sudaska Curie, but in that as well, I will specifically talk about the PhD. But before I enter to the topic, I just wanted to give you an 
what is exactly the rational behind the Mari Soda Stock Curie Action Program? What is the idea of this particular program uh, putting forward uh, mobility and career schemes to uh, young researchers? So, uh, European Commission is uh, running a um, framework program called Horizon 2020 under this pro program, the excellence of science, where the Marie Curie is uh, one of the initiatives which is funded under the excellence of science. This specifically uh, give emphasis on skill, knowledge, and innovation. That is the core of this entire program to an individual. So the entire program is basically uh, has given a lot of emphasis on mobility. So why there is a, so much of fuss about the mobility? If you see, look at the Marie Curie overall funding for this 2020 is 6.16 billion euros for seven years. They are supporting around 65,000 researchers out of that 25,000 PhDs uh, fellowships are offered and there are more than 30,000 uh, researchers across the university uh, industry are part partnering with. So why there is so much of fuss about the, the uh, mobility of the researchers? If you look at this particular program has gradually increased the substantial funding. It started way back in uh, 1994. Uh, so now the funding has reached 6.16 billion euros for the seven years and the entire program as i already mentioned that it is the basic underlying is mobility why why so much of us about the mobility because the commission the european program believes that mobility provides a sharing and transfer of Okay, I'm audible. Uh, I think I, I got muted in between. Samrat, can you reconfirm? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we, we can, yeah, yes, I can we can hear you. Okay, okay, fine. Sorry, sorry for the, this thing. So uh, this particular program provides uh, the sharing and transfer of knowledge, the mobility between the continent, between the sectors, between the organization, uh, organizations and disciplines. That is what the rationale behind this program, this funding of 6.8 billion is given to an individual researchers to, uh, to acquire new knowledge, new skills and new perspectives because all this contributes to and researchers creativity, efficacy, performance, global network and culture of collaboration. That is what the entire Marie Curie program is built upon and that is what you should understand before even you apply to the program please read and understand the philosophy of the funders, why this funding so much of money has been given across the globe to and young researchers. So even you are preparing an application, it is important to know the basis of the, the basic facts of the program. As I already mentioned, mobility is the key of this particular program, intersectoral, multidisciplinary. Again, it is a bottom up. It is given an opportunity for the researchers from any field to come forward with an idea and apply for uh, the grant. Uh, it is also providing intersectoral collaboration that is academic and industry together um, can participate in this particular program. It is open to the entire world. It is open to the all nationalities. There is no age ba barrier. The career, you can start your career at any um, time. Sometimes you have a break, so you can also uh, start a restart the career under the Marie Curie program. So promoting an attractive uh, working conditions because these are one of the best funded uh, programs and also gives a very good infrastructure facilities to the candidate in European universities and industry. And it also provides equal opportunity and social rights when you are in Europe. These are very competitive um, fellowship program and evaluation is peer review process and highly um, highly valued uh, peer, uh, peer review international evaluation. So under this program, there are uh, five different initiatives. The first initiative that is what I'm going to talk today is innovation training network, which covers basically a doctoral trainings. And then there is an individual fellowship, which is meant for the postdoctoral fellowships, then research and innovation staff. Yeah, 
I think Sorry, it's uh, giving some. Problem. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah. Okay, it's, don't worry. So this particular program also gives an opportunity for the researchers to collaborate across the uh, countries, across the sector. That is what the RICE program is meant for. The co-funding program is meant for the funding agencies to have a uh, joint funding, uh, doctoral and postdoctoral research funding program. But today I'm going to speak about the about the uh, PhD program, but if you are interested to know about all these four or five schemes, please visit to the Marie Sudasko Curie Action website or your access website where these schemes are beautifully explained. So today's topic is doctoral training program under the Marie Curie program. So what is exactly the objective of this particular program? Because if you need to understand the objective, the principle of this particular program, then it is much easier to complete right record uh, there's some issue i think a lot of people are actually say telling us that they're not able to hear you though uh, the presenters can hear you uh, loud loud and clear there's some issue with the, yeah. audio, the, the, the audience i think there's some issue so let me just 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 give me two minutes just just, sure, just uh, sure. Let me know when when you fix the problem, because huh? I cannot see anyone on the screen. Sure. Someone can do some audio checks. Just say, keep saying. I'll just ask them to uh, let the, let us know if some audio is uh, if they can hear the audio. I I think my audio should be audible. Then uh, you you can uh, you can ask them if I can they hear me. So Malia, can you put the, some questions in the chat so that they, they respond whether I'm audible?
Yeah. Uh, Vivek. Yeah. Uh, so there seems to be a, some technical problems that uh, some of the attendees are not able to hear. My my suggestion is we continue, and we will of course uh, this session is being recorded, and we will share uh, the recording uh, with all of you and the presentations. Please apologize. There is some technical problems which is not in our hands. But I would ask uh, Dr. Vivek to continue with his presentation and we just go on with the webinar and we try, maybe we can fix it in, in during it, but uh, for sure you will get a recording and the presentations of this webinar. Thank you. Vivek? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, can you did hear you me? Hear, yeah. Did you hear what I said? Yeah, sure. Uh, I know we lost Dr. Vivek for a moment. Somalia, um, are the attendees able to hear me? No, they are not able to hear anybody. Okay, okay. So, and we lost uh, Vivek for a moment. That's of course a bit of a, a bit of the downside of uh, of um, modern technology that uh, we're totally dependent uh, on it. Um, I really apologize for that. I hope uh, Dr. Vivek will uh, come back uh, uh, as soon. I will just try to see if I can reach him. Vivek, can you hear us? Is it possible, Vivek, to you can hear us? Vivek, if you can hear us, then give us a thumbs up, please. Seems like there is a audio problem with Vivek as well. Um, Vivek, if you can hear us, can you give us a sign?
Okay, uh, Somalia, I, I think we, we have some problems with Vivek. Um, let me just uh, do my presentation. I sure. will try to get him back. Yeah, okay. So now Vivek, mic is there. I think, see, he has muted himself. I can see that his mic is back, but he's muted himself. Now he's unmuted. Vivek, can you hear us? Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes, yes I yes. can hear you, but I don't know. Yeah. Okay, Vivek, we, we just continue now with your presentation, okay. please. Okay, I will continue with the presentation. Uh, okay. So the objective of the uh, <clears throat> innovation training program is basically to create a new generation of uh, researchers. So these are not regular PhDs. These, these Marie Curie fellowships are different than the regular PhDs. So please note down the the, the this important fact because this particular PhD is giving and training uh, to innovate an early stage researchers. So what is early stage researchers according to Marie Curie? Those people who are having a less than four years of research experience, they consider them as an early stage researchers. They nurture the excellence during this uh, training. Early stage researchers are giving excellent and innovative training uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, formation during this uh, PhD program provide skills to match public and private sectors because these PhDs are not a regular PhD as I said they are meant to create a new generation of PhD uh, researchers what it means that the researcher should not only limit his idea to a laboratory but it is meant that idea to be translated transformed into the market products so that is why there is a fusion between academia and industry and that is what these PhDs are unique. They are different than the regular PhDs. And what they expect from this particular PhD is to improve career perspective of the researchers, structural high quality research and doctoral training, collaboration, academia and non-academia. That is what it meant for. And it is a bottom up. It supports almost all scientific fields as well as the economics and social and humanities. So this covers all spectrum of uh, fields. It is a multidisciplinary approach and it is also exceptionally in, uh, encouraged and non-academic uh, sectors to be part of it. So what what this um, Marie Sodasko Curie funding uh, means for the um, PhD program because this program are de designed by the universities, small scale industries, public and private entities, basically non-profit organizations considering the future problems, future technologies, future breakthroughs which will come from different disciplines. So these programs are designed by a different sectoral uh, participation, uh, as you can see. So this, these are under the uh, ITN program. There are, again, uh, three different categories, but today's focus will be only on PhD. So the first category is European Training Network that is for the ongoing research uh, uh, program for three months uh, that maximum anybody can go and uh, this thing. But that is not meant for a PhD. The full-time PhD is covered under the European Industrial Doctoral Program and European Joint Doctoral Program. So these are the two main initiatives through which the PhD funding is provided uh, to the young researchers. So again, in the European Industrial, it means uh, it, this uh, title itself indicates that the industrial participation in the PhD program is mandatory. And in the European joint um, doctoral degree where the academic institutions participation is mandatory, but they can also include the industry into it. So I will just show you how it works. The in European industrial doctorate, it means it, it gives a partnership between academia and industry. So these are the two mandatory uh, partners. So when you are selected for the PhD, that means you will be doing 50% of your research, research work in industry and 50% in academia. Obviously, the universities will provide you the degree, but this is then collaboration between academia and industry. There could be a more partners involved into it. So under the European Joint Degree Program, it is basically designed by the group of universities coming together, for defining the future problem, future disciplines. So, for example, three universities comes together along with the three universities. There are, could be an industry NGOs are associated with that. So you have a bunch of option to um, 
you know have a intersectoral interdisciplinary approach that is what it means for a mari sodoscope uh, uh, program so in 3 years you will be moving in different universities country sector that is the uniqueness of this particular program so as i already mentioned this mari kuri fellowship is strictly meant for 3 years that is 36 months so you when you are recruited your countdown starts from that particular day if you don't finish within the 3 years you may get an funding from the university itself but the commission will not continue the funding after 3 years so it is meant for 36 so you can finish the phd within 3 years or less than that but cannot be more unless and until the, there is no guarantee of funding after this 3 years so what is second meant as, as i already mentioned it is lot of intersectoral mobility so in the industrial oriented phd you need to spend time in different sectors that is 50% with industry and 50% with the uh, university and under the joint phd degree you will be uh, moving in different countries different uh, universities so it's very challenging on one side even though it is very exciting but in this it is challenging to finish in such a, a short duration in different uh, sectors so as i already mentioned they are extremely good funded phds they are one of the best uh, fellowship funded phds for the phd they provide 3110 euros per month plus you get a mobility allowance of 600 euros plus family allowance if you are married and your laboratory where the institute or industry who is hosting you they also get an additional amount of 1800 euros for research and networking training cost and management cost of 12 months so obviously these are the gross um, uh, salaries the salary at net salary will be calculated as per the country coefficient considering the social security and the taxation because this phd please note down this is not a fellowship this are considered as a salary it is a paid job so you are exactly become a researchers into it so where the mari if you are a part of the mari kuri program and when we are applying to this particular program this programs give you an opportunity to go or to be available and host institution in 27 countries plus 66 uh, 16 associated countries so you have an option of almost 43 countries to be a part of host institutions so which are those countries there are 27 member state uk just left from the eu but i will come to that point today the switzerland is uh, with us the switzerland is a associated country to the european um, program horizon 2020 so you have an option to move around in this particular countries i will come to that point how you are going to have and different options of moving around so there are a lot of people going from india to uk because uk has a very strong uh, connections with india but unfortunately this brexit happened so the uk is no more part of the european um, european horizon 2020 program but still they can host the indian in, um, um, phd postdoc in their laboratory until the completion of the horizon 2020 funding so you can consider uk as a potential host for your phd and postdoc until the funding of the horizon 2020 is complete so how does it work because i said in this particular program you are not directly applying to the uh, funders you are applying to the university so how the process happens that is what i am going to explain you in next one minute to so, the bunch of universities industries come together they define the new field new thematic areas which is futuristic so they they define different um, uh, challenges which could be of interest to form a new researchers so they pro, um, they form a consortium and they write a, a proposal to be funded by the european commission so they propose this idea or this pro particular proposal to the commission for a funding there are several hundred proposals we receive every uh, call so few of them get selected because they are highly competitive if they get selected the consortium get directly grant from european commission to the universities and uh, industry so those uh, consortium they advertise the call for candidates okay so you are not applying to the commission you are applying to the consortium who had defined the problem 
so they call for candidates they apply uh, announce those across the world this is open for all the um, student researchers across the world so you they interview you they they take all the um, necessary step for the selection it is done exclusively on the um, university um, uh, level so if you are selected there is a contract between you and the universities where they are going to recruit you so what happens how 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 does it happens now this consortium for example i just picked up uh, some examples from uh, your access website the phd grant those consortium who managed to win the uh, european grant they advertise this phd position so as of today there are hundreds of phd available i will just pick up there are 15 phd positions in under the itn program in again it is related to biological science chemistry physics medical it is multidisciplinary and see look at the institutions which are participating in this particular consortium and there are almost seven uh, european countries par uh, partnering into this particular program so again example there are 15 phds in quantum uh, computation that is physics and these are the series of universities involved in this particular program so there is a possibility that you will be moving within these particular countries if you are selected uh, during three years again uh, another example computational science uh, these are again 10 to 15 phds uh, open in this particular field then mathematics so i'm just trying to give a glimpse like the problems are already defined you know who are these people you know which universities are going to be applied so here that is the uniqueness of this particular program so what is the basic rule of uh, to be eligible because what the european commission or the more um, uh, marie curie uh, program had specifically mentioned as an, a basic mobility rule that you should be if you want to be eligible you are to qualify for that you shouldn't have spent more than 12 months in last three years in that particular institution or particular uh, university or that particular country so i will just give an example for example i am i did a masters in last three years uh, in paris or uh, for, for example in france so i cannot select i am not eligible to go again back to a particular country immediately unless and until i finished but i can apply to a different country like i can go to um, italy i can go to switzerland i can go to denmark i can go to netherlands apart from that uh, france i am eligible to apply for some other country because they want to increase your network uh, during so you they they don't anticipate you go and same lab and same people again and again that is to widen your horizon widen your network that is the the reason behind it so who how to apply for phd position as i already mentioned the candidate doesn't apply to the funders it is already the program and the funding is already secured by the consortium here the project consortium announce uh, the, the announcement is like applying for the job and you will be applying predefined problems uh, by the consortium and you will compete uh, with the different uh, category so and i just take a sorry for there are a lot of uh, you know uh, text into the file uh, some writer doesn't like it but because these slides will be shared with you uh, just who is eligible what the universities are um, anticipating when you are applying for the phd it may vary with um, uh, university and consortium to consortium but generally what what it is meant so that is what i just take it out they need a master degree at least minimum first class that is what is anticipated the age there is no limit but as i already mentioned they are supporting early stage researchers so normally after the masters or after your masters one or two years of research experience those people they are really tapping in as a potential phd candidate there is no restriction of nationality these are the global fellowship you are competing across the world and this is not mandatory requirement for the language proficiency but most of the advertisement i i see that if you have not have a master's in europe they may ask you gre or tofl or ielts course just to make sure you have a, a language proficiency but again it is not a mandatory requirement it varies with the consortium universities what what you need uh, during uh, when you are going to apply for this particular um, uh, position so 
obviously the master degree certificate which you need to have at least a provisional if you have completed a master's a degree certificate in hand a transcript of your uh, gra um, graduations then um, your cv that is the important document because that is the reflection of your uh, curricula and your expertise the personal statement is one of the most important document uh, of the uh, of your application because these are the like motivation letters why you want to be part of that particular program so that carries a lot of weight to it then letter of recommendations that is expected from if you have done some internships in universities or research institutions or ngos so you can propose those people as a potential references their rec recommendation letters are highly valuable to assess your uh, scientific skills and again the if you are able to provide the language proficiency certificate you have an additional age or the other again it is not a mandatory requirement so where do you find all this information uh, um, uh, of these positions available uh, advertisement again samrat after me will give you an exact live demonstration all these positions are um, advertised on your access website under the jobs and funding it is also uh, advertised under the Marie Sodaska Curie website under the jobs and funding is nicely one of the very interactive website. You can just filter it out which program it suits to you. So these are some uh, facts or the figures which I wanted to give you to motivate you because Indians are doing extremely well in Marie Curie program. Among the non-European countries, India stands number one as far as the PhD number of PhD fellows are concerned then more than 1000 Indian had managed to crack the uh, Marie Curie program. So this is very uh, a good sign and the, the European research institutions, universities values the uh, excellence which the uh, Indian masters uh, uh, universities are bringing out. So please take this as, as a very positive uh, signal because even though it is highly competitive, there are 15% success rate but because you are competing across the world, but still 1000 PhDs are quite a significant amount. So take a, a um, you know, positive out of it. So where these people are going, Indian nationals are going normally. So maximum PhDs are going to Germany, then UK, France, Italy, Spain, Netherlands, Belgium. These are the whole, but these are big countries, but they have smaller countries which have excellence, which had really uh, shown their uh, innovation as the uh, main action. For example, Switzerland is one of them. So you, you can choose any country of your choice because it gives this particular program gives wide spectrum of choices to you. Who can help you out? So as I already mentioned, the your access is meant for that. The, the, we are here to help you out. And this entire exercise of uh, um, your access and European delegation, we are there to help you out to find and guide you during this process. So this is my last slide before I conclude because, uh, you know, preparing for this PhD because you already must be motivated uh, to do, uh, you must be having a lot of curiosity uh, to do in that particular uh, field. That is why you are choosing the PhD because the PhD, to do a PhD, you really need a lot of patience. You need to accept the failures because research is a lot of about failures than the success. So if you have that kind of a temperament, then only you look at this particular career. So if you are applying for this particular um, PhD grant, start early, look at the particular advertisement early, try to study it because as we Indians, we had a uh, habit of going a last minute uh, preparation. It doesn't help because you are competing across the best people across the world. So start early, decide what area you want to be specialized because this this particular moment is going to define your bread and butter for next 15, 20 years because you will be super specialized in that particular area. So please spend sufficient time to understand where your core um, strength are, what is your likings are, what, what are the areas of uh, expertise you want to develop. Spend time uh, in understanding the potential supervisors, but in your case, uh, the Marie Curie case, it is, everything is already defined. These are the best people across the Europe who put forward the grant. So that is one minimum exercise. You can do it for the Marie Curie. Think about your non-academic life as well, because you, you need to leave uh, and you need to perform, uh, spend time in that particular country, get integrated into the culture. So think about which uh, aspects of, uh, apart from the research. 
and whenever you are preparing um, any PhD uh, grant or the uh, position, please do reconnaissance because you need to understand the, you need to know what is the lab strength, what are the weaknesses, who are the people um, sitting there, what are the, their strengths and weaknesses, what added value you can bring to it. All these important um, points you should prepare in advance. Uh, again, you don't have to um, apply for one or two programs because they are highly competitive. So make sure you make a sufficient number of applications in different programs. So you have a liberty to choose which you like the most. As ask your uh, ask yourself what is exactly the interest as as already mentioned because in the research also there are different disciplines and different uh, ways. Because I am a marine uh, biologist, I I, I spend fifty percent of my time on on the field because some PhDs are totally inside the um, uh, labs or inside, but some uh, PhDs require extensive field work. So you can also decide which kind of a profiling, which kind of a PhDs you are interested in. Uh, make sure you are prepared your um, uh, sufficient because you get only three years time uh, to um, finish your PhDs. Most of our PhD uh, masters are not really uh, tuned to exactly start day one research. So I always ask the master degree students to spend time in national institutions, big research institutions, universities where the research is um, significantly conducted. Get your hand, hand dirty in the lab. Try to understand how the research is. Uh, so always very useful to do that. Also make sure you uh, project yourself uh, as a having some background of research which can be demonstrated by your manuscript, um, the, your uh, de dissertation uh, during the masters. If you have a co-authorship pro project that also help you to demonstrate that you have a scientific temperament you can interpret your results you can write in good languages so these are the things which you need to prepare before you apply because you are competing against the best people so take care of um, this uh, important aspects before you apply ask questions to your supervisors you can contact earlier you can also write to the people in the lab uh, or the postdoc to understand the the culture, the problems, what they are right now dealing with, scientific problems, I mean to say, and spend sufficient time and on your application, your motivation letter on CV, which reflects you what exactly you are competing with. I think I will stop it here. If you have any questions, you can write to me or Samrat and wish you all the best. Uh, thank you very much. Over to Samrat. Thank you so much, uh, Vivek. Um, unfortunately, uh, the technical problem is remaining. Many uh, were not able to hear us. Uh, they had to leave uh, due to that, but we informed everyone that we will send the recording of this and also share the presentation. Uh, really sorry about that, but we still have uh, many who are uh, uh, still on and uh, we have a few questions, Vivek, which I would like to take now with you. One question came, uh, what if uh, I have done my master's and I have a gap of some years? Is, is, is it still possible for me to apply for a PhD under the Marie Skodowska Curie Actions? Like the time gap, does it play a role? Yeah, so absolutely you have full um, uh, chance to apply for a PhD even you have, after the uh, master's you have a gap. But you can also demonstrate what you had done in those three years, whether you are doing a job, whether you are doing any any internship or because that four years it should not be in just blank uh, this thing because that is the disadvantage for you but if you manage to showcase that you have some kind of a, even you are working in an industry that will also uh, significantly help uh, um, your profile as well so there is no restriction as such if you have a um, break in between uh, it's all depend how convincingly you convince the, the, the universities and the industry uh, with your profile. Thank you so much. Another question was, uh, you were speaking in one of your last slides about life in non-academic sector. Like, could you yeah. elaborate a bit more? Also, the Marie Skloska Curie PhD uh, programs are often also connected to the non-academic sector. And, and here in India, we often consider PhD only within classical research labs, but maybe you could elaborate a bit about that. What do you mean with the non-academic life? Okay, 
So uh, as I already mentioned, this particular program is a new generation of PhDs. What, what they try to do, because I, I form my PhD is completely academic uh, sector. So in last few, um, one decade, more and more research is now trying to translate into some kind of a product. So what used to happen that researchers are only preparing their own publications and uh, maybe patent and that, there it used to end. But now what the program is offering that when you are having a PhD itself, it is giving you an exposure from the lab as well as the industry. So if you have an idea how to commercialize it, how the, the industrial um, uh, prospect comes into the research. So you are formed both ways, academic as well as industry. That is what it meant for to have a industrial part, uh, participation. And that is why the 50% of your PhD time is spent in industry so that your thinking is not only science, but the science to be translated into a product. Yeah, that's very important, you know, that how to bring the research out from the from the lab into the market and also into society. And these days we are seeing with the COVID pandemic how important it is that scientists, researchers try to find solutions to very challenging problems. So these programs are designed, as Vivek said, to help you to connect you more with the industry and the, and the market outside. Uh, we make there are a few more questions, but due to time constraints, as we had these technical issues in the beginning, we will not take them now. There is a possibility to send uh, Dr. Vivek your questions. Uh, he has uh, shared his e uh, email ID on the slides, which we will also forward to you. Uh, next presentation will be that of your access. Uh, that will be a short presentation. And then we also have our uh, countries, European countries, uh, their speakers as well waiting to uh, share uh, the opportunities which are in uh, on PhDs in their country. So I'll start with my presentation now. Thank you Vivek again for, for a very excellent presentation. Let me know. Thank you. Just, uh, yeah, okay. Um, just give me an okay if you can see my presentation. Yes, we can, Samrat. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, Vivek already mentioned Uraxis a few times during his uh, uh, during his presentation, and this is a network tool which was developed by the European Commission uh, many years ago to help uh, to bridge uh, the research co collaboration between Europe and the world and help uh, researchers to have international research career. And this network tool is made out of four uh, components. One of them, the most important component is uh, uh, we have a job and funding portal. I'm not able to uh, move my slide. Anyway, uh, the, the first component is jobs and fundings. We have a, a database with over 60,000 uh, positions which we publish annually. And we, you have the possibility as an early stage researcher, as a PhD, or also as an uh, advanced researcher, as a postdoc, to go to this jobs and funding database and look for um, uh, positions in your field. We also provide information and assistance. I'm just trying to see if I can uh, uh, move my slide. Yeah, uh, we have uh, information and assistance on our website. And uh, this is supported by uh, our uh, European member states and associated countries. So there are 42 countries which are part of the Euraxis network, and they give you hands-on support for uh, different forms of assistance which you need. So let's say you have, uh, you've got a PhD, you've got a grant, a fellowship, and you're about to move to a, a European country. Our officers and colleagues in the respective countries will give you very much practical hands-on support about your moving, about uh, 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 information about accommodation, supporting you and your family in settling down in a new country. There's also a partnering tool which your access offers. This is more for organizations or head of institutions who are looking for international collaboration. There's a database of around 17,000 organizations registered with your access where you can find uh, ideal partners for a collaborative project uh, under EU funding, for instance. Uh, and we have the worldwide component. Your access is represented in different countries and different hubs across the globe. And one of them here is in India. 
Already I mentioned the uh, numbers. So annually we publish 60,000 job vacancies, like a PhD, for instance, as Dr. Vivek also mentioned, is considered as a job with a very handsome salary in Europe. So right now we have over 10,000 uh, job vacancies for uh, graduate or uh, postgraduate students and uh, established researchers. We have uh, uh, around one lakh users with Euraxis. So if you become part of this Euraxis community, you also ha have the possibility to connect with, uh, with re researchers across the world. There are a lot of funding opportunities also. Also, we have a, a section on travel grants where you can maybe uh, apply for uh, um, uh, some uh, seed money for traveling and attending conferences. The network is open to all areas of science, technology, and innovation, but also social sciences and humanities. Here you see the Euraxis World Wide Web with the different hubs. So we have also the possibility to connect you to researchers in the US, in South America, in Australia. So it's a really global network uh, helping researchers to develop an international career, uh, uh, providing them with skills and, uh, and helping them to basically become much more a, a global a researcher. This is a very, um, I think a very good opportunity for those who are interested uh, to uh, look at our Euraxis worldwide different hubs. Here we come to the Euraxis uh, India website, and I wanted to just uh, give you a practical guide uh, uh, through it. So here you see this is our Euraxis India website. Let me just go here. We are here, Euraxis uh, India .uraxis .org. So here you see uh, what I spoke already about jobs and funding function, career development, partnering, information assistant our national portals. So these are um, the national websites of all the member states and associated countries. Let's go to the job and funding. You see here, you have, this is I think the most important and most relevant for you at the moment. Here you can uh, click on this button, find jobs. And once you click here, you see there are different uh, engine search tools. Uh, with like say your research profile, you uh, mostly would be uh, a first stage researcher means a PhD candidate. Uh, and you can like here look at the sector, the research field, and also the country. Let's take for instance, Netherlands, which is one of the presenters today. Here you see for early stage researchers, there are currently 228 positions available. Let's click on the search button. And here you see it pops up. Here we have, for instance, fully funded PhD position at Utrecht University on innovation digitalization and sustainability with uh, uh, at Utrecht University, deadline is 27th of June. Another PhD in celloplastics chemistry also in the Netherlands. So here you see there's a lot of, uh, over 200 uh, positions are announced here and they're regularly updated, okay? This was just one example. If you go to our career development, you can find a lot of information about uh, how to optimize your career, how to improve your skills as a academic, but also as a communicator. And uh, there are a lot of interesting articles, but also interesting tools. And also uh, we organize different webinars on that. The partnering tool I mentioned already, you can find also members and organizations and update your profile. Um, information and assistance, here you see what it means to live in Europe, uh, practical information on accommodation, banking, health insurance, work uh, regulation tax, work permits, but also if you're planning like to leave Europe and return to your home country, what, uh, what uh, departure conditions, formalities, everything is here available on our Euraxis site. And especially also you can go to the national portals like Euraxis Netherlands, Euraxis Switzerland, and you get a lot of information about the country, about the research uh, landscape, the different sectors, the culture, and what are the practical um, um, arrangements you need to make if you're planning to move to that country. So it's a great platform and how to how to become a member. Membership is free. You just uh, click here, uh, you go to, uh, uh, you just go to your Access India website and here you see, here you see that button, sign up and become a member. You press that, uh, free registration. And then it takes you to this site. You uh, put in your email and uh, you will get an, e an, an, an response on your email, giving you the steps how to register and a welcome message. And once you have registered, please remember to go back to your Access India. Once you have become a Euraxis member, 
then you basically uh, have here the option will appear sign up. So here you can sign up for the Uraptis India community and get all the information and tools uh, which are relevant to India. You can see that on our website, we announce news, uh, different calls which are uh, attractive for Indian researchers, uh, but also events where, which are relevant to Indian students and researchers. So this will be very helpful for you because we will provide you with regular information about upcoming calls, uh, timely calls, uh, events which are relevant to you once you decide to become a member at the at the Erexus India community. Yeah. So back to the presentation. Just to give you an example of the Maurice Glodowska Curie uh, Action uh, PhD openings, which are right now, this is right now the time. Now this is the month, June, uh, until uh, mid-July where applications are uh, accepted. So uh, Dr. Vivek already showed you some uh, examples. Here we have, for instance, uh, 15 PhD positions within the Neurotrans project. This is a project across many nine European countries. We have uh, a P three PhD positions uh, at the University of Glasgow in business studies, 27 PhD fellowship opportunities in photonics research, also across Europe, uh, 11 PhD positions in socially engaged art network, fine art. This is also in social science. So you see that we have a variety of PhD opportunities under the uh, Maurice Rudowska Curie Actions. And this is just a selection which I'm providing you, but you'll find the exhaustive list on the Euraxis India website. Okay, next slide. I'll uh, try to see if I can move to the next. Yeah, okay. So once you join our uh, community, you will uh, get regular information about uh, different opportunities in your field. Uh, through our flash notes, our newsletters, and of course, we also organize regular info session webinars and you will get timely information on that. Uh, we also organize a very interesting um, event every year, which is the Urex Science Slam. Maybe you have heard of that. That's uh, um, an entertaining event where we want researchers to get a little bit out of the lab and present their research in an entertaining and fun way. And um, uh, the Science Slam is going to take place this year as well. Most probably it will be an online uh, virtual slam. Uh, the first prize will be a trip, round trip to Europe. We will announce it in, in the next coming months. It's really about making science fun and accessible. You can use different uh, props and different tools like theater, dance, pra uh, um, practical experiments. These are the winners of the last two years who got a boarding pass ticket to Europe. Uh, Prabhava Chakraborty from Bangalore and Sayani Das from Mumbai. So this is your opportunity. Please join uh, your access and make your international uh, career uh, come uh, true uh, by just registering at our website and getting all this uh, information uh, available to you for free. As I said, the membership of, of our network is free. You can also follow us on the uh, social media channels on Facebook and Twitter, where we also regularly put interesting information about uh, uh, European research policy and uh, open funding opportunities. Okay, so that's, uh, um, and of course, feel free to write to us. That's my, uh, from my side now. And um, if you have any questions, please send them directly to me. I would now uh, ask uh, um, our next presenter, Dr. Indra Neel, uh, Ghosh from the Embassy of Switzerland uh, to tell us more about the opportunities for PhDs in uh, Switzerland. Indranil, you have to unmute your mic. Okay, now I'm unmuted and I hope everyone can hear me. So yes, yeah. let me Very just good. get rid of my camera. It gives me some more space. Uh, so thank you, Samrat, for giving me this opportunity to present Switzerland uh, and the opportunities from there uh, in this webinar. Uh, I'm Indranil Ghosh and I work at the Embassy of Switzerland in New Delhi and I'm also part of the Swiss Next India Network. Uh, so why, why choose Switzerland? Uh, Switzerland's at the heart of uh, at the heart of Europe, and most uh, most places in uh, in Europe, or at least Western Europe, are within uh, a comfortable uh, 
train ride or flight away from uh, from Switzerland. Uh, the popular notions of Switzerland are uh, the cliches: Heidi, fondue, chocolates, books, uh, watches, beautiful scenery, etc. But Switzerland is also many other things. Um, Switzerland, for one, has excellent universities, um, and we believe that 50% of students in the Swiss university system study in one of the top 200 universities in the world. Switzerland is home to large um, international companies. You see the logos of some of them, but I could put in thousands more. Um, it is a very international environment. Uh, Switzerland has, has uh, just over 8 million uh, residents, and 25% of them are foreigners. And 50% of the PhD candidates um, and 48% of the professors in the Swiss universities are foreigners. And Switzerland is an innovation powerhouse, uh, having been in the top 10 of the Global Innovation Index uh, ever since it was first uh, published in 2007. Uh, and since 2011, Switzerland has topped that ranking every year. So the Swiss university system, very briefly, uh, uh, of interest to you are the 12 doctoral universities. Most of them are very, uh, very highly ranked, uh, as you can see from uh, from this table. Uh, I'll not read the details since you will have the slides. Um, you see 11 listed. There's uh, one more University of Lucerne, which is um, which is a more re a newer university. And at the doctoral universities, the focus is on fundamental research. There are also nine universities of applied sciences and arts. Uh, which work on applied, um, on, on applied research as opposed to the doctoral universities, uh, as well as the development of research findings into marketing, marketable innovations. There are no doctoral programs in the universities of applied sciences and um, less of interest are the system universities of teacher training, teacher education, which train the school, uh, the school teachers in Switzerland, but also do research and development and uh, offer continuing education courses to, to the public. They are international because some of them actually have uh, collaboration programs with universities in India. Uh, so where do, uh, I mean, uh, with what I have put in the last few slides, I hope that uh, you will think of Switzerland as a possible destination and which brings us to the first question, uh, to the basic question, where do I find my doctoral program? Uh, there are 469 doctoral programs which are offered in the universities and specialized, specialized institutions. They cover all domains of research and details of them are found in this website, uh, studyprograms.ch. Um, it's a fully searchable, um, it's a fully searchable um, uh, website. So you can, uh, you can say you want a doctoral degree in say computer sciences, uh, uh, in English, uh, and when I click, uh, I mean, I get I get 13, uh, 13 uh, results coming out uh, in in most of the universities. So that's uh, that's where you find the information. Uh, Switzerland is an is an expensive place to live in, uh, but um, as you can see from this table here. Switzerland does not make much of a difference between foreign students and uh, Swiss students uh, as far as tuition fees are concerned. Um, so of the 12 universities, only seven charge something in, in addition to, to non-Swiss students. Um, and um, I mean, these, uh, these figures are in Swiss francs, but uh, you can say it's roughly equal to a, uh, to a US dollar. So, uh, one year at the Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne will cost you 1,320 um, uh, Swiss francs at the at the doctoral level, uh, and if you come to the University of Zurich, it's down to 500 francs a year to do a PhD. Um, most, um, I mean, none of the professors, uh, or most of the professors will not take you in unless uh, unless you have funding. You have funding, and I'm not talking funding from from your parents to do the to do a PhD program. So almost every uh, PhD student in Switzerland has a job at the university. It could be either doing the working with the professor through funding from him or taking some classes or something. Um, so that's um, getting the funding is not so much a problem. 
The tuition fees are cheap um, because Switzerland believes that um, investing in a good education system has been uh, amongst the drivers for making one of the most um, uh, well-performing economies in the world today. And uh, so Switzerland does spend a lot in uh, teaching in the, in the university system. One of the ways of finding the finding the funding would be through the Swiss Government Excellence Scholarship Program that uh, that we run out of the embassy. Um, for you, these are tenable at the ten doctoral universities and the two federal institutes of technology. The next call for applications is expected in August 2020. Uh, the application package will not be available on our website. You will have to write to us, and uh, you have the email ID. If you send send me an email now. Uh, I will store you. I'll store it, and when the package becomes available, uh, uh, it'll get emailed to you. And more information on the scholarships are available at um, at this website. Uh, and to know more, um, there's a very very cool website uh, studying in Switzerland plus. So I'll just give you a brief glimpse uh, glimpse into it. Um, so, I mean, you have all kinds of information living in Switzerland, a uh, whole lot of things, details about universities, uh, the whole um, uh, whole program, tuition fees, scholarships, uh, program duration, whatever whatever information you might look to to be a student in Switzerland, you will find it find it on this. And there's a lot more um, lot more fun stuff, fun stuff as well. So I invite all of you to go go have a look. Have a uh, have a look at this uh, this site, uh, and uh, yeah, that was my presentation. Uh, this purposely kept short because I was told I had ten minutes. So over to questions. Um. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh... I mean, Indranil, thank you. So my yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe you want to switch on your cameras. Yeah. Um, so. There is one question which also, um, well, Indranil, first of all, a very uh, much in time. Like, thank you so much for keeping the time limit. Um, I have and I think I get into another call, so you know. <laughs> I know, I know you, you are having another uh, yeah. uh, meeting today. Um, yeah. Indranil, um, so there's one question which I think is also yeah. for the others. But I would like you to answer it. Um, sure. It's said that sometimes highly experienced students only get the PhD. What about uh, students who do an MSCA in more, let's say, in semi-urban cities in India, like let, let's say not so well-known colleges and universities? What about their chances? Like, can you say something about from your experience in Switzerland? Well, it is it is true that uh, it is true that. Uh, if you come from one of the reputed universities in India, you'll stand a stand a better chance of getting uh, getting admission into one of these programs. Uh, I run the I run the Excellence Scholarship program out of the out of the embassy, and uh, there are exceptional students in the smaller, well, uh, less lesser known universities. Uh, I, I can only speak about the scholarship program and. Uh, one of the things we have to write in there is an appreciation from the embassy. And if you see a brilliant, if I see a brilliant candidate from um, from a university which has no 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 name recognition, but I feel that this is uh, this is a good candidate, uh, I will say so. And I have been told that uh, the comments that we given from the embassies are very well appreciated by the by the committee that that decides on the attribution of scholarships. So. If you're good, you're going to rise to the top. It doesn't matter from where you are. And one thing I forgot to say um, um, is that whatever Vivek had presented about uh, about the Marie Curie programs, uh, uh, Switzerland, although not a member of the Euro European Union, uh, is associated with the framework program, which uh, which funds um, uh, funds the programs that Vivek was talking about. So Switzerland can be your destination uh, through a European program as well, and uh, Swiss universities do very well in attracting funding from the European uh, from the European programs. Thank you so much for mentioning also the Marie Curie programs. And of course, Switzerland is not a member of the EU, but it's a member of Horizon 2020, which uh, to which uh, the Marie Curie is a part of. 
Uh, one last question, Indranil, before you yeah. head off to your next meeting. Um, yeah. This is also a question for like, Switzerland is uh, predominantly a German speaking country as mostly India think of, but we have more languages in Switzerland. But how is it with the uh, English? Like, do, do, does one need to worry about, uh, you know, uh, going to Switzerland? Okay. No, one, one does not need to worry. I spend about two weeks uh, a year in Switzerland and uh, I do not speak German. Uh, our network, uh, our network in India, I'm Indian. In South Africa, my counterpart is a South African. In Russia, my counterpart is a, is a Russian national uh, and so on. My counterpart in the UK is a German national. We all speak in English. Um, all undergraduate teaching in Switzerland happens in the regional language. They are, Switzerland has four national languages, um, German, which is spoken by about two thirds, uh, two thirds of the population, about 20% in the western part of Switzerland speak French, um, about 9% to the southern part speak, uh, speak Italian. Uh, and there are two or three valleys in Switzerland of, uh, I don't know, hundreds maybe, where the language is rated Romans, but uh, at the PhD level and the universities, everyone speaks English. So uh, it is not a problem. Uh, I the, was once attending an event uh, at the Federal Institute of Technology, an internal event, uh, which they were handing out some prizes and uh, I was telling my boss, should I really go? Because it'll probably be in German. He said, okay, let's try and see. He went in a purely internal event and it was in English. Very good. Thank so you so much. That's, whatsoever. that's very that's very assuring. I think uh, people should not be worried if they apply for PhD opportunities in a country like Switzerland. Uh, it's also very well known for its nice hospitality and great uh, uh, culture and nature. So a wonderful place uh, to do your PhD. Uh, thank you, uh, Indranil, thank you for, for, for joining us. Yeah, and uh, we will share your presentation with the attendees. And if you, yeah. whenever you have to leave, uh, please uh, do that. Uh, well, I have another 10 minutes, so I can, yeah. I can so hang around for a few more minutes. Maybe you are, yeah, you can uh, listen to our next uh, presenter, yeah. uh, which is uh, Dr. Mika from the Embassy of Finland. Uh, Mika, the mic is yours. So you can see my slide, right? Yes, yeah, perfect. You can see, okay, thank you. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, Samrat. Uh, and thank you for this opportunity to share my, my slides and this information with the students. So I work in the Embassy of Finland in New Delhi uh, and uh, presenting the Ministry of Education and Culture and Science of Finland. So I have much more slides than I'm, than I'm intending to go through in details, but I think that when you spread these slides to students, they can go in, in, in more detail to, to have a look. So Finland is a Nordic country. Uh, actually, uh, the northernmost university in EU is located in Finland, in, in Lapland. It's a very exciting uh, country. We are, belong to this Nordic group of uh, countries. We speak uh, Finnish and Swedish uh, as native languages, but uh, English uh, is uh, very prominent also in, in our country. So uh, our education system and universities are ranked uh, pretty high. And Universitas 21 uh, survey, normally Finland is uh, floating between second and eighth uh, position. So in top 10 uh, normally. Uh, so very good universities actually, uh, and uh, very, very good teams in individual universities. Here you can see the European Innovation Scoreboard uh, showing the innovation leaders in, in Europe shown in green color. So it, it pre pretty much uh, in, in uh, Nordic part, uh, northern part of uh, Europe uh, and Switzerland, of course. Switzerland is white there, maybe it is so snowy, but I know that in this survey, particular survey, uh, Switzerland was at the very top, so uh, or at least almost at the top. So very good countries, all of these as a, a choice for, for students. Um, and Netherlands also belongs to this group, by the way. So Finland has been in, a, if you look at different uh, rankings, innovation and, and technology and education. So Finland is a, is a usual suspect at the top of those, uh, many of those rankings. 
here is an interesting detail that uh, if you look at the countries with uh, non-English speaking countries, the Finnish adults are the fifth best in, in, in speaking English. So it's uh, very safe actually to go to, to, to Finland, uh, although uh, uh, officially uh, English is not our native uh, language. Um, so what are the strongholds of Finland uh, R&D? I will in the following slides show some highlights, uh, but uh, as a general and big picture, I would say that this uh, uh, wireless technologies are the other strong, very strong areas in in, uh, in Finland in in different uh, domains. Of course, this is the homeland of Nokia, but also Nokia would would never have been able to make this success without a very strong research basis that there exists in Finnish universities. Uh, for instance, in, in Oulu and in Aalto and in Helsinki University and, and so on. So we have uh, pretty many uh, universities, uh, uh, actually 13 academic uh, uh, traditional universities, which are shown in the right uh, side of this slide at the, at the top. And, and uh, then we have uh, 24 UAS, University of Applied Sciences, which are more profession oriented. So when you get out, uh, out of those UAS, you most likely already are pretty well connected to, to working life and industry. And at the bottom side of this slide there is a list of uh, national research institutes, which uh, also hire uh, researchers and PhDs uh, to, to their uh, labs. This is a picture, don't, don't get scared, I just show to, to indicate that uh, there are many funders to give money to universities and basic research. So it, depending on how much your work is towards uh, industry, business and application, uh, it depends where the money comes from. Uh, the Ministry of Education and Culture is mainly funding the, the basic uh, research. So the total budget of the public uh, domain is 3.5 uh, uh, billion uh, euro. Uh, totally, when industry included, it is 6.5 uh, billion euro. Now I will briefly show you some of the flagships uh, of the Finnish uh, science so that you get some idea of that where are the strong areas of science. Here are listed three, uh, sorry, six uh, uh, flagship uh, uh, programs uh, funded by the Academy of Finland. In this slide, you see the faces. So the topics are uh, uh, 6G, which is in Oulu University. Actually, Oulu University has been very a uh, key player in all in, in mobile techn technology in the history. So they were developing 3G, 4G, 5G, and now 6G together with the leading companies like Nokia and Huawei, for instance. Uh, then we have FinCRS, which is materials bioeconomy. Uh, then uh, let me move, I, I have problems in seeing. Then we have the social science uh, team. We have uh, artificial intelligence. Then we have cancer research and we have photonics. Uh, the reason I saw this slide is that uh, all of these teams are searching PhD students very actively. So they are in constant need of uh, talent. So uh, you can basically contact them anytime and ask for details. Uh, as I will mention later, also, also the in Finnish universities, when you get the PhD position, you you get full salary. So you are you are always paid by the by the uh, uh, research team. Uh, so. Uh, so this flex program program is an example of very heavily funded project. It is they get uh, 500 million euro for three years, and they are running eight years. So there are plenty of opportunities also for uh, for students, PhD students, and postdocs to 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 get into these teams. Then uh, this is very interesting. Finland is having a. Uh, the fastest uh, super computer in public research in, in, in the world. This is uh, this will be taken into uh, practice in the early part of next year. So it is a consortium of uh, several European uh, countries. Uh, actually, uh, EU is putting 100 million euros to this and Finland 50 million and then uh, a cluster of other countries are putting quite, uh, quite much money into, into this very exciting thing and we are very happy and proud to have this in Finland. Uh, this is in Finnish, this slide. Maybe later on you can use Google Translate to have a look. Uh, the, these are the strongholds uh, of, of the Finnish uh, science. 
So this big, big, uh, big uh, uh, ball uh, in the middle, uh, right uh, in the middle of the of the um, uh, scheme, shows that uh, electricity automation and uh, information technology is a uh, is a big area, and it is very strong area of Finnish science. On the left hand side, in the vertical uh, scale, you see the citation index. So anything that is above one, above one indicates that it is uh, cited more often than uh, average in in OECD countries. So uh, ICT is strongly uh, is clearly the, the strong area in Finland. But also uh, clinical sciences that's quite big uh, big ball over there, and and genetics and and agriculture as well. Um, so I will go to uh, academic job opportunities in Finland briefly. Uh, so as I said, normally uh, you get fully paid in the university when you get into these PhD programs. Uh, I will uh, show also the, the website very soon. So normally it takes four years to study, uh, to make the, the PhD, and you may be partly placed in, uh, in uh, or funded by industry as well. So as said, you can always contact faculties and professors directly. They have uh, application periods for, for those, and normally they are in autumn, in September. So for instance, Helsinki University, which is uh, pretty well ranked globally, it is normally in Shanghai list, it is uh, between 50 to 60. So they have several uh, doctoral schools, and then uh, inside the schools, they have these doctoral programs. So having, uh, it's good to check the website to see the details of the application uh, uh, time. This is just an example uh, Turku, in Turku University. Uh, they have uh, 50 funded doctoral training positions available next se September. So you can go to this link and uh, have a look at them in more detail. Again, in Turku University, they have 10 to 15 funded postdoctoral and research positions uh, open annually. Also, you can go to the website and, and, and have a look. There are these slides, I will not go into detail. You can have a, have a look at the strong areas of research and in, uh, in Finnish uh, universities. Uh, and then in this final slide, I have uh, also in, in Lut University, they indicate the open positions. But actually, you can easily go to euraccess.fi all Finnish universities are indicating their open uh, job positions in, in that website. Uh, study in Finland, uh, it is very similar to that shown by the uh, Swiss colleague. You can go there, you can give the keyword and make a search that what area you are uh, interested in and you can seek for the uh, study programs. When it comes to master programs, there are hundreds of English speaking, uh, fully English speaking master programs in Finland. Also, uh, uh, also PhD programs, and they are all in English. So it's uh, basically impossible in Finland to make a PhD in Finnish or in Swedish when you are in a technical uh, domain. They all are made in English. So, and you can always write to me and ask uh, for more details. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm, uh, I think I may have some time for some questions as well. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mika, for this very interesting uh, presentation about Finland and uh, different uh, research sectors where Finland is very strong in, and there are a lot of synergies with uh, India as well. Um, a couple of questions uh, to you. Uh, what are the, uh, one of the questions is what are the job opportunities for international PhD students after they have completed their PhD in Finland? Like, are there possibilities to be picked up by companies, or what is your uh, take on that? Yeah, this is very good and very important question, of course. Um, like uh, those top research teams that I showed, for instance, those flagships are by definition, in, in order to get funding from the Academy of Finland, they already have to be very well connected to industry. So their connections to companies are very close. Like I mentioned, uh, for instance, in Oulu University, they, they have a cluster of our ecosystem of uh, IT companies there. Uh, there are five uh, 5G test areas in Finland, in Finnish universities. So if you go there, the universities are uh, offering test test area for companies to test there, for instance, when they develop 5G uh, devices. 
So for instance, in 5G and mobile technology, you are when you go to those university teams, you most likely already during your PhD, you are dealing with uh, projects that, uh, that the companies are running in, in collaboration with uh, Finnish uh, research. For instance, Wipro, the uh, big player in Indian scheme, is they just established the lab in Oulu University for 5G. Uh, I know that Infosys and Tech Mahindra are also looking uh, at the collaboration with Finnish universities. So already Indian companies as well are, are there. So in certain areas like uh, IET, uh, mobile technology, uh, also in uh, biotech, uh, biotech, especially uh, bio, biomedical sciences, I think uh, uh, the connection to companies are, are very, very close. Thank you so much uh, for giving a very a good answer to this. Um, uh, one more question I would like to ask you uh, from the audience is, um, during the PhD, is there also teaching involved at the universities or is there, is there like pure research PhDs in Finland? Uh, that in, in PhD programs, you always uh, make some, uh, some uh, courses as well. You have to take courses. It's not only research. So, uh, but it is not, uh, it's a reasonable amount. So you can do it alongside with your, your research, but you have to, yes, you have to do courses to, to make, to get the PhD. Yeah. But, and sometimes, and you also, sometimes you also may get involved in teaching by yourself. Uh, that is, to, that is fully possible. Yes. To master students as well. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And I think that's a very, very interesting experience also to, uh, get some uh, some some insight to teaching as well while doing your PhD because maybe some will decide to stay within academia and continue their uh, career there also and become teachers professors. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Amika. One last question which just came up, uh, I think, which is also interesting for the other countries: medical insurance. This will also be part of the funding. Like once you get a fellowship, you also covered in the health. And, and social. Uh, in, uh, yeah, uh, Finland like, actually. Finland actually is uh, the top country also in uh, social security. Everybody who lives in Finland is automatically uh, uh, gets the full health uh, insurance. So uh, it, it, when, whenever you get accepted and you are uh, permanent, uh, you could get a permanent residence in Finland. You you have the security, social security. So. Basically, uh, going to hospital is for free. You normally, as a student, you you also get uh, discounts on almost any any price, like train ticket, uh, air ticket, everything. You get normally the, the reduced price. So it's a very good place to to stay. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think Finland has a very high standard when it comes to living quality. Also, the public health sector, the social security system is one of the best in the world. And also the education system is uh, one of the best in Europe. And as you already said, Mikael, English uh, is uh, very common in already a master level on, on PhD. The working language is often English in this project. So uh, a very exciting, interesting country to look into more. Uh, you also have uh, the email ID of, of Mika. Um, if you are interested in more specific questions, he can definitely help you to uh, connect you with uh, different uh, um, universities and institutions in Finland. Thank you so much, Mika, for, uh, for your presentation and your time. Uh, um, we will now move to our last speaker, uh, which is also very uh, a fascinating, interesting country in Europe, the Netherlands, also known as Holland. And uh, Subroto, I would like to give the mic to you. Um, yeah. Uh, Subroto, you're there? Yes. Okay, perfect. We can see you. Just uh, yeah. Just be waiting yes. for your slide. And the presentation? Uh, not yet. Now we can see it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you, thank you, Samrat, for having having us uh, as part of this uh, discussion on PhD. And also thank you to all the other people who have joined in before. Hi, I'm Subroto. 
I represent uh, Netherlands Education Support Office, which is East India, which is part of the Netherlands uh, Higher Education and Culture Ministry. And today we are going to talk about look for a PhD program in Netherlands and what are the different factors you should keep in mind. So I feel that we are running short of time. So I would quickly like to take you through some slides. Uh, and as you can see on this slide, Netherlands is a very, very, very small country in mainland Europe or in Western Europe. But yeah, as we say, it's a small country with big opportunities and uh, as, as, as there are many, many people, students, different nationalities starting or working in the Netherlands, the opportunities are boundless. And uh, there are, yes, when you in the Netherlands, so many, different things, so many different activities, events, which you can attend and see and experience, get the whole feel of the country. So it's going to be very exciting. There are specific, very interesting like the King's Day, which happens in April. There's also something in the class which happens in December, where the whole country and the city will be on the streets. They will be having different events, carnivals, parties. So it will be a real experience. Once Um, Subroto, sorry to uh, it, to um, interject. Uh, your audio has completely gone. You have muted yourself, I think. Yeah, and if you, and I think the network is an issue. So maybe you can switch off your your webcam so that you know uh, the presentation is visible and your audio is clearer. Uh, should I start from before or should I go on from this slide? You can start from no, the I beginning. I think it's good. Yeah. yeah. From here? Yeah, from here is fine. Now it's now it's your audio is right. very good. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. So as I was saying, there are different uh, different things, different uh, advantages when you'll be studying in Holland or Netherlands, as, as we call it. So as you can see, there are people from more than 160 nationalities living in the Netherlands. So once you go over there, you will, the, uh, the culture, the atmosphere is going to be very multicultural, very multilinguistic. Also, you would see that influence in the food, in the people and different shops around around, around the country. So it's going to be a very, good experience for you. It is also one of the happiest places on earth. It is ranked number six out of 156 countries which were uh, which were researched on according to the World Happiness Report in 2018. And Holland and Netherlands is also well connected to different parts in Europe because when you will be seeing or doing PhD in Netherlands, you will have access to Schengen, which is accessible to different countries, have greater exposure, travel, find out more about different people, different nationalities, and also in Netherlands itself. So it takes only 2.5 hours to reach Paris, it takes three, five hours to London, and it takes five you know, half hours to reach Berlin by train. So it's pretty well connected. And Netherlands is also considered the number one country in the world when it comes to English proficiency for non-native English speakers. So once you are in Netherlands, if you are on the road, if you want to talk to local people, or if you're lost, if you want some direction, you want to know about certain things or certain things in the shop, everyone speaks English. So you won't be out of your comfort zone trying to communicate with the locals over there. Everyone speaks English and everyone is nice, welcoming, warm. So you will have no problem communicating with people in the Netherlands. And the, in Netherlands, the education system is divided into research universities and universities of applied sciences. As my other uh, counterparts, they have already mentioned, research university basically means the education over there would be more academic based, to be more research based. And university of applied sciences would mean it would be more practically inclined as in you will have more on the job training, you will have more internship opportunities to, throughout your course. And uh, yes, top 12 universities 
of of the of the world uh, from the top 212 universities are from netherlands this is according to the world university ranking by, which was done which was done by times higher education and this is for the year 2018-19 but yeah as you can see and one out of every eight student in the netherlands is an international student so once you're in the class, you will see it's very multicultural uh, in, inside the classroom as well. So that's why when you will be doing your research when, with your colleagues, you will see a lot of people from different parts of the world. And yes, Netherlands is also quite safe. It is ranked 23rd amongst the 163 countries which were surveyed. So once you are traveling inside the country, the transportation system is really good. So you can always take a bike and be self, uh, you can be, um, independent in traveling and trying to go wherever you want without the use of any public transport. The infrastructure is really good over there when it comes to bikes, so you will be in no trouble whatsoever. So now we are going to talk about how do we go about doing a PhD in Netherlands. So as you can see from this slide, the in holland research is carried out by the research universities which are the one of them either the research institute or different companies only the 14 research universities can award a phd degree so this is very important and if you are planning to do a master's in netherlands uh, if you do it from a research university then it gives you a better chance to apply for a phd uh, for for against if you do it from a university of applied sciences and this uh, research uh, institutes they work really close together when they're collaborating with uh, universities and they can also provide position for phd candidates so for an overview of dutch research universities there is a there is a link over here which is www.studyinholland.nl slash institutions but when once the presentation is shared with you 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 can definitely have a look now why do phd in holland so there are there are quite a few advantages on doing it so as you can as you can see it is ranked second worldwide in number of publication per researcher it is also ranked second worldwide in impact of research publication which is very important and as i was telling you it's very the the atmosphere is quite international and there are 45 percent of phd students in holland is international throughout, throughout the country and Dutch universities are also ranked amongst the top 2% of the universities. As you can see, there were 12 Dutch research universities uh, listed amongst the top 200 in the world. So the number is quite high and the quality of education and research is very, very good. And yes, you will have different large, larger variety of research fields on which want to work. there would be more options as compared to some of the other countries. PhD is not regarded as a study, but a serious research, yes, as you, as you would all know. Uh, and researchers are often paid positions uh, or paid employees, but it is always not that case. So moving forward, uh, these are the type of PhD positions. As, as, as for example, these are the different paths which you can take to, uh, for doing a PhD. And the first one is researcher employed by the institution this is quite uh, explanatory as you can see candidate sign an employment contract with research institute or university to do their research it is quite simple you will be at the university as an employee and you will also get a remuneration as an employee you will not be looked as a normal student now there is another way if if, uh, if you're not getting getting through this process there is also fellowship or grant process, which is which through which you can also attain a PhD. Now, for this candidate finance their PhD through a fellowship or grant program, and they are not employees of the institution. So, if you do a PhD through the fellowship or grant program, you will you will get a grant. You will do your research, but you won't be treated as a employee of the institute or the university there is another way phd next to a job which means you can do a phd uh, while you are holding a full-time job that is also but there are different challenges and different ways. Uh, 
um, moving forward. So now I'm going to discuss in detail how to go about when 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 we want to do when researchers are employed by the institution, how to go about this process. Institution, sorry, institution research create a research proposal for which they create PhD positions. So this is very important to know that an institution research group which would create research proposal. And once the proposal is approved, through that, when the proposal is approved, they will create certain PhD position inside the institution, or the university. Now, these are open to all international candidates. Now, positions for these sort of, when you are being employed by the university, these are usually advertised on specific job boards. Uh, job boards, which is uh, so this is for example, we have given you an example, which is www.academictransfer.com, and it would also be published sometimes in scientific journals, letters to other academic institutes from the institute where PhD positions have opened up. They will contact different institutes from around the world to look for suitable candidates, and it will also be mentioned on institution website along with your access website, as you have already known. Now, if you are not being able to find a specific position, a specific research position which you want to do, you can always proactively propose a re research to the research group. If you, as you, as I mentioned, if the vacancy is not listed for the interested topic, and for overview of the discipline that are offered by the research university in Netherlands, you can always visit uh, www.bsnu.nl. So once once we share these slides with you you can definitely go ahead and have a look what are the different disciplines and what are the um, you know what are what are the different things which are offered for a phd program now we talk about the second way of getting into a phd program which is through fellowship or grant now candidates for this one they need to do quite a bit of research by themselves which uh, which they can do it on uh, www.studyholland.com dot uh, nl slash scholarship and there is also another specific west website just dedicated to uh, finding grants and scholarships in the netherlands which is called grantfinder.nl and on top of that yes obviously you do have the your access website now for this approach you need to find a supervisor at an institute who will support your proposal and uh, will act as a mentor for the research so this becomes very very important you you need to proactively reach out to different uh, universities with your proposal and uh, to to different people and they will they will take a call now you can directly in, inquire to the central information office of the institute as well which will give you more information about different people who are mentors or in a position to be a supervisor to that you can get in touch with them Supervisors can be found through international network as well. Sorry, and uh, you along with the candidates and professor. And uh, what you can also do is you can uh, if you can visit different alumni network for us. It's all on alumni.nl where you will find different people who have done research and they have they have a great network in the Netherlands who can definitely help you out to reach out to the right kind of people or the mentors or the supervisor who is going to take care of the PhD. Now the last one, this is a very self-explanatory one, which is next to your job. Sometimes it is possible to obtain a PhD degree when you're doing a full-time job. Usually these are sponsored by employer, but it is at the discretion of the company and also with you, how do you want to take it forward, whether they want to allow it or not. So if they are interested, if they think it is going to add value to their company, and if you think this is going to add value, if you do a PhD while you hold a full-time job, you can definitely get in touch with the institution of choice with more information, then it depends on you and your employer. How do you want to take it forward? Now, these are some of the basic document required. There might be certain changes because in Netherlands, each university is very autonomous. They act on their own. But this is to give you a rough estimation or um, a general overview of what documents they might ask when you are applying for the PhD program. 
yes, a detailed CV would be very important, which includes information about your studies, language, achievements, skills, etc. So this becomes very important when you're applying for a PhD program. Now your motivation letter, that also is quite important because you are not just a piece of paper or document or degrees or certificates. They would also like to know your motivation, what, what motivates you, what, what makes you, what drives you to go and do a PhD. So that's where motivation letters also become quite important, explaining your motivation and suitability for the position. So that's why they would ask for that and contact details of two references, name addresses, email. So that depend that could depend from university to university. Some would ask for one, some would ask for two, some would ask for more as well. So you have to check before you start the application process. Now reference letter, yes, from the references which I've already mentioned, university may also ask for actual letter of uh, on on, uh, on letterhead of the organization they are working in or university. So that becomes important as well now your diplomas your certificates everything scanned they they you have to send it you also might need to send the originals so that that depends now official or academic transfer yes document enlisting your performance as a student and also what are the modules that you took what are the credits you gained and also the grades which were awarded and if you have not completed a degree yet then include the grades which you have already obtained so far. So it depends. Now, if you have not finished your course, then you will only give uh, the information of what you have got so far. Now, English English language skills uh, is important. And usually when you're doing a bachelor's and a master's and IELTS or any other English proficiency test is very important. Almost all the Dutch universities will ask for it. And on a scale 6.5 is usually the minimum requirement, but for a PhD, the, the minimum requirement much be, might, might, be, might be more. So you have to check with the university or with the supervisor what exactly they're looking for. Now, just to give you a small overview. So this is one of the uh, PhD candidates. Her name is Amy Corby. She was from Canada. And as you can see, her experience was quite good when she when she did her PhD, and she hopes that the collaborations would continue. And she had already established a good network while studying her masters. Through that, she was able to build and uh, finish her PhD. So it was it was quite good. And uh, the career opportunities in Netherlands is quite thriving, according to her. And once you finish your course, your PhD, you get an additional one year stay back period, which is known as the orientation year. So that is also an added benefit. So once you finish your PhD, if you're looking for a job or if you want to work on something else, you can always uh, stay back and you can take that orientation year within the next three years from the time you finish your PhD program. So it's quite flexible and it's an added advantage. Now, there are some practical practical aspects of doing PhD. Yes, the PhD position in Holland are high quality. Therefore, the candidate, it's a prerequisite to have a very solid background in research and the method in the field, what, what they have already done. And they, the candidate needs to have a recognized master degree. So it was already mentioned in two slides before that uh, what, what are the documents which are usually asked for and dissertations are usually written in English. So this requires a full mastery of English idioms and grammars. So that's why language skill test is uh, very important. That's why the IELTS exam or the English proficiency test might become very, very important because they would also like to check your level of English knowledge. And some in Dutch Institute, they might ask for some uh, tuition fees for enrollment and for supervision. And sometimes they would also ask for certain costs if you have access to very expensive uh, lab uh, on, uh, and material inside or uh, machinery inside the lab if you're working with them. So there might be some facilities charges which, which you might incur. Now, I'm just giving you some example of notable Indian PhD scholars uh, who, have, who, have, who have done their PhD from Holland, Netherlands. We have Ms. Uh, Dr. Manisha Arora, which, which is an assistant professor at Indian Institute of 
science and he did his PhD in applied physics from University of Twente. Then we also have Mansi Bhargava and she did her uh, research in uh, public administration, PhD in public administration from Erasmus University Rotterdam. Yes, there are lots and lots of examples, but just to keep it short and simple. So we just wanted to give you some example, not extensively. Now, we also know that while you are living, there are certain cause, there are certain aspects which you have to keep in mind when you also are choosing a country, how expensive is it? how livable is it and how convenient is it for as an Indian to go over there and settle in seamlessly. So as you can see, the living charges are not as high uh, if we compare it to other parts of uh, Europe or US or UK, I would say. The rent, this is an example of a student uh, in, in Netherlands. So he's paying a rent of 515 euros per month, which includes all the utilities, and for groceries, you might spend somewhere around 100 to 125 euros a month. Now, there is also expenses for the phone bill, which might amount to 25 euros a month. And transportation might cost him 25 to 50 euros a month. Now, it also depends. If you have a bike, just, just keep in mind, you won't have to pay for any transportation fees when you are traveling inside the same city if you're for, for your daily usage. Yes, when you're traveling from one city to another, then you have to take the train or the bus. But usually if you have a bike in the city, there are no other transportation costs. Yes, you have to pay for your health insurance once you are a student. Remember when you're on Grand on Fellowship, you can have an Indian uh, health insurance. But if you, are, if, you are, if you are employed by the university, then you are an employee of the country and then it is mandatory to have a Dutch health insurance. So it is very important. So on an average, if I can put it, it can be 700 to 750 euros a month, but it depends on the student and the lifestyle and so many different factors. So this is just a rough estimate and average of how much you might spend in a month if you're living in Netherlands. Now that's, that concludes my presentation. So if you have any other questions, so we have our website, which is called www.nisoindia.org and uh, you can get in touch with us. Our email address is mentioned, which is info at the redmiesindia.org. Our landline number is also mentioned. You can also follow us on the social media platform and also follow Study in Holland um, for, for different news, updates, videos, and any other queries. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samrat, for having me, giving me this platform. So that's it from my end. Thank you so much, Sobroto, for this uh, very detailed and also very well structured uh, presentation. Um, you uh, you touched many different aspects, not only what opportunities are there, but how to apply what is required. Also, the living cost, I think, is very important to know. Uh, what are the expected living costs in a country like the Netherlands? Um, I have. We are uh, already at the end of our time, so I'm just taking two questions for you, and I'm. Again, inviting all the attendees to send their questions directly to the panelists uh, um, on their email IDs. Um, if, if one has already a PhD, can one do a second PhD in the Netherlands? Like, can one apply for a PhD? Uh, I yes, yes, you 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 can. But now again, it depends from university to university how they are how they are looking for the can what type of candidates they are looking for. So that becomes uh, important. So it is very subjective. It depends on university how they want yeah. to take it forward. But yes, you can definitely go ahead and apply or at least ask the question. Hey, can we apply? So it depends yeah. on university how they are going to take it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, thank you. And the last question, uh, which I'm uh, picking up here, is Subroto. Um, if you could uh, talk about, you were you had one slide on uh, the supervisor, you know, there's even a dedicated website where you could uh, look into, but do you have any any tips how to approach a supervisor in the Netherlands? Like, is there something cultural one has to uh, take into consideration or any tip for the candidates? Yeah, so what from my previous experience, sometimes we also talk to PhD candidates or students who are doing PhD. Sometimes, you know, it's it's it also depends on being in the right place in the right time. Sometimes 
also through my experience like sometimes you know something some research or some groundwork that you have already done in a specific project or a topic and then you know there are very well renowned professor in that specific university and you write an email stating that see this is my work you know you send in your work your uh, whatever you have done and it depends on how you interact with that specific person so it clicks in a moment that hey this candidate looks interesting i should have a face to face meeting with him online or have a phone call with him so that becomes important i i, I do remember there is a nobel laureate from the university of uh, koningen his name is mr ben feringa he did a, he got a nobel prize in uh, biomedical sciences and there was a phd student who was traveling with him in india he was an indian student but he wrote an email with all his work whatever he did and it depends on how impressed the you know the supervisor or the mentor or the professor is so it's it's again you know you have to take it one step at a time and don't be disheartened if someone does not reply it does not mean your work is not good enough or it is lacking so you have to keep on trying and reach out to more people so on an average if you reach out to 10 people you might get one response so yeah. you know yeah. it depends yeah. on how motivated you are exactly exactly thank you so much subroto um you you pointed it out very well uh don't be dis uh, encouraged if you don't uh get a reply at the first time you know there are plenty of opportunities we've seen the netherlands at the your access website for instance there are over 200 announcements right now study holland has a lot of opportunities finland switzerland so there are like you know almost 44 countries in europe where you can uh, uh, look for phd opportunities we just selected uh, a few today we presented the EU uh, programs as well. Um, so now is your now it's your time. Do you uh, now we gave you kind of a teaser. Now you go on your back to your laptops, visit those websites, look into this program, see if there are fellowships for you, see if there are any kind of um, um, programs where where your research field uh, would fit. Um, and we are of course here to help you and guide you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, all um, the attendees who stayed back. We know there have been some audio uh, technical problems, which unfortunately were out of our hands. We couldn't solve that, but we have a recording of this session. We will send it uh, as soon as possible to all the attendees and the people who have signed up as well. And I would like to uh, thank all the panelists, um, Dr. Vivek, uh, Dr. Mika. Uh, Mika, are you still there? We are not seeing your face. We're not on the screen, but maybe you hear us. Anyway, uh, thanks to Mika, and of course, thanks to Subroto for uh, for your time and your presentation. And uh, wishing you all a nice uh, weekend, a nice evening, or, or midday, wherever you are. And uh, see you again. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Sundar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Sundar. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, bye. 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 Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.